Hey everybody, it's Julie, Kansas City girl in a Colorado world. Happy Leap Day! It's February 29th. Um, I thought I would get a quick video out before I go to a special class. Um, Nikki's Creations, the cross-stitch designer, is coming here um, to teach. Well, she's here and she's teaching a class this afternoon. It's like a half-day class. Um, it's in Longmont in Colorado. Um, she comes every year the week before market or a week or two before market and she visits friends here in Colorado and she graciously does um, like a four hour half day class and then she continues on to Nashville for market. So I went last year for the first time and it was awesome. It was super awesome and so I had to sign up again this year. Um, the project is really, really cute. We know what we're making. It's it's not like a mystery. Um, I will show you next time. Um, so I thought I'd get a quick video out before I go. Um, I'm going to try to kind of keep it short so I can get um, lunch and then get to class. But this is floss tube number 56. And like I said, it's leap day. It's February 29th. Um, I have not a terrible lot to show you, but I've um, made some progress. I have a couple finishes and um, worked on some whips and I have some plans. And um, the first plan, of course, is the Nikki's Creations class this afternoon. But I have some other plans as well. Um, what I don't have is haul. I don't have any haul. I think that that is the first time I've probably ever been able to say that on a floss tube. <laughs> this is number 56. I think it's the first time I haven't bought anything. Um, it's not, that's not entirely accurate. I did buy some stuff, uh, but it's pre-orders for Nashville, so I don't have it yet. So um, I'm not showing it as haul because it's not here. Um, but I did buy some stuff, I'll be honest. So uh, for anyone who's uh, maybe not as knowledgeable about the cross stitch terms that I do casually like fling out, um, I'm trying to be better. I realize that some people like I just say things assuming, you know, most in the community know what I'm talking about, but some people are sitting there going, what? So Nashville market is um, held every year in Nashville in March, and it is um, basically a, a trade show for cross-stitch and needle arts, and you cannot go and participate unless you are a designer who has been approved for the show or you're a shop. So it's like wholesale pricing. Um, it's not for the general public. So um, a, a lot of local needle workshops will travel to Nashville, buy all the things, and then come home and have like market day or market week where they have all the new goodies. So it's a it's a cash and carry show, which is also really nice. Um, they go and they can immediately get the product and bring it back and sell it. They're not waiting for it to ship. Um, it's a chance for designers to show off kind of what they've been doing, new designs. It's a big deal in the cross stitch community because it means lots and lots and lots of new patterns for us to obsess over and have to buy and stitch. Um, there's always like some Nashville exclusives where you can only get it at the, at the show. Um, so you have to tell, you know, your shop, you need to please get this for me. Um, you're not going to be able to get it later online. It's just for the show. So, um, it's always a very exciting time in the cross stitch community. You know, it's like, Ooh, Ooh, what's, you know, what are they going to, what's this designer got for Nashville or will, or you'll hear people say for market, what do they have for market? Um, but that's when I talk about market, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, just about everything I think is now out, um, except for a few designers. Shakespeare's Peddler, uh, does not release what 
uh, she's taking to market until I think like right before and Blackbird Designs um, also will will not do any sneak peeks. Um, you won't know until market. But just about everybody else I think that I could think of that I care I guess about right now um, we know what they're taking. So I've already placed a pre-order and I did my pre-order with Top Knot Stitcher Abby. Um, Abby has had an Etsy store for a while but she just released or she just um, opened an actual website. It's topknotstitcher.com and um, you know lots and lots of places were doing Nashville market pre-orders but the reason I went with Abby is because her website was just so so easy to use really well done like she has you know you go to her website and it's like here's all the Nashville stuff for pre-order it was super easy um, she had the most comprehensive Nashville um, collection that I had seen because I had looked on Etsy at the Cottage Needle and needle case goodies which I've ordered from both of those before and they're both very very good um, but and I had looked at their Nashville page but when I looked at Abby's there were ones I hadn't seen so I felt like she did a really really good job of like curating all of the Nashville stuff um, her prices you know everybody's prices are gonna be pretty comparable um, but Abby has amazing shipping. Her shipping is only $3 and I ordered a lot of stuff. So that was awesome. Um, I believe Teresa Kitten Stitcher also does $3 shipping. So keep that in mind. But um, anyway, I ordered from Top Knot Stitcher. Order from whoever you want. But it was super, super easy. Super nice. Like I said, all the Nashville stuff was like right there. And I found stuff I hadn't seen before and had to order. So um, I cannot wait to get that. And I'll show you guys that haul when it comes in. You know I will. So um, yeah, so that was a, a really long talk about haul to not actually show you any haul. Let's move on. Um, I got a gift in the mail and I got it a little while ago, but I didn't show it in my last video because I did that in my car and I just didn't want to take tons of stuff into my car. Um, so, uh, uh, Jen, um, I forgot her Instagram handle. I think it's Jasmine Ravenclaw. I'm pretty sure that's who she is on Instagram. Um, she's active in the in the community. She comments a lot and participates in posts on Instagram and Flosstube. So most of you probably know who she is. Um, and I think we kind of hooked in um, together from when we were in Magical Stitches last year. But anyway, um, she, she, we chat periodically, but she had asked if um, she could send me a little something for my birthday. Um, so she sent me these amazing needle minders that she made herself. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> so um, the first one is a Harry Potter. It's um, advanced potion making. So it's one of the, you know, the books for potions class at Hogwarts. Um, she put super big, super strong magnets, which is awesome. These things are not going anywhere. And then it, she sent me, um, this one is from A Court of Thorn and Roses by Sarah J. Moss. Right here. Right here. Um, I've only read the first book. I'm going to read these two. Or three, I mean. There's two more books and then a novella. I will read them. I just haven't yet, but I will. Um, I have read the entire Throne of Glass series. So anyway, this one is from the Court of Th Thorn and Roses. Um, to the stars who listen and the dreams that are answered. And I think it's from the second book, which I haven't read yet, but it's fine because I will. And then the third one she sent me is from Throne of Glass series. Um, this is the... So... Funny story, um, for anyone who's read that series, one of the characters, the Black Beak uh, Witch, I read the whole series and in my head I said her name as Manon. 
It's spelled M-A-N-O-N. So she's, to me, she's Manon Blackbeak. I read the whole series and then found the post where the author said how you should pronounce the names. And she says the name should be Manon. So I need to like get that right in my head. Um, it's Manon Blackbeak, but in my heart she'll always be Manon Blackbeak. Anyway, here is a needle minder for the 13 Blackbeak Coven. So thanks, Jen. I love those. I've already been using them. Um, I think she also sent some to Carla, Rolodex stitches, because I'm pretty sure Carla showed those in her last video. Um, which makes sense, because Carla loves that series as well. <laughs> so, um, and then I got some awesome stitchy kindness. Um, I mean, that was awesome stitchy kindness as well, but I got more stitchy kindness. So, um, from Amy Gable Stitcher, my cross stitch BFF. Uh, she sent me a little something for my birthday. I say a little something. She sent me a lot of somethings. Um, <laughs> so she sent me, I'll just show you guys like the little stuff and then I'll show you like the real, like the real present. Um, so Amy sent me some needle minders as well and they're amazing. So there's two Harry Potter ones. Got a Hermione and a Honey Dukes. And then she sent me this, uh feminist needle minder. I'll read it to you. It says, men, their rights and nothing more. Women, their rights and nothing less. It's a quote from Susan B. Anthony. And this is very fitting because uh, this is the centennial, no, bicent bicentennial, sorry. Um, no, no, it's the centennial. Math, math is hard. I'm actually not terrible at math, but I'm really bad at date and year math. I don't know why, but I'm really bad at it. So like if someone tells me like they were born in like 1987, I'm like, I have no idea how old you are. I can't do that math. Um, I mean, I can, but it takes me a second. So anyway, it is the centennial <laughs> anniversary of women's suffrage, women's right to vote. Uh, with the caveat, uh, that would be the centennial anniversary of white women's right to vote in America. Um, black women did not get the right to vote until I think 1968, which just like blows my mind. That's insanity. This country is so messed up sometimes. Um, so anyway, in 1920, well, okay. So in 1919, um, the Women's Suffrage Act made it through Congress, made it through Senate, um, and was basically passed. However, it wasn't ratified into the Constitution until 1920, when all of the states had the opportunity to vote on adding it to, to the Constitution. So 1919, 1920. So this is the centennial. Um, a lot of patterns started coming out last year. And if anybody's wondering why, it's because it made it through Congress in 1919, became part of our, the law, the land, the law, the law of the land in 1920 in August. I know my dates. I'm going to stitch a pattern this year for it. So yeah, so there you go little history lesson with your floss tube. All right. So, and then Amy sent me these Alice, um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, magnetic bookmarks, which would be very handy. I have a lot of bookmarks, but I use a lot of bookmarks. Like I have bookmarks in these mugs. I have, I have some down here in this mug down here. I like to rotate my bookmarks. Um, she sent me this, um, I, I tore off the packaging. Um, it's a little notebook with like grid. It's just with gridding, but they, it did say, I think on the packaging that it was a cross stitch design journal or something. I mean, I think it's supposed to be for sketching like quick cross stitch, um, ideas. So a cute little notebook. Um, she sent me 
this amazing, amazing book journal. Um, she said that this is something she likes to, she gives quite often to friends because it's just so awesome and perfect. So she got this from her local, or I don't know how local it is to her, but a cool bookstore near her. It's called An Unlikely Story. It's in Plainville, Massachusetts. And um, it's called The Book Lover's Journal. So it's a nice compact size, which I really appreciate. I don't want like a big, huge thing. This thing is awesome. Um, wow. It's, it's really good. It has a lot of really cool features. Um, so it has, at the beginning, it has um, where you can quick like index the books and then say what page in the journal um, you need to go to to read, you know, like your review. But um, it's a two page spread for each book. You know, obviously like title, author, number of pages, genre, um, how I discovered this book, when and where I read it, noteworthy experience experiences while reading this book. Um, should I check out more of the author's books? And then um, it's got a really cool rating um, system, like quality of writing on a scale of 1 to 10, pace, plot development, characters, enjoyability, insightfulness, ease of reading. So it's got like this really interesting like breakdown. And then over here, it's just notes and opinions. So um, plenty of this journal is just that. So you can put lots of books in here. And then it's got another section, reading wish list, books I'd like to read. Um, it has, an, I mean, it's got several cool sections. So books I want to read and you can even put like, you know, who recommended it or why you want to check it out. Um, there's a section to keep track of books you've borrowed, lent, given. Um, so you can just, oh, there's a section for like contact info for where, like websites you like. Um, and then really cool stuff in here too. Oh, there's a book group section. If you have a book group where you can put all their names. Um, this section is really neat. Um, inspiration for future reading. And they have um, recent Nobel laureates in literature, so you can go check some of them out. And then there's a list over here, recent Pulitzer Prize winners. So you can kind of like run through that gamut. I've read a lot of them because I'm uh, very literary. Um, and then, this is really cool, Among the World's Greatest Books. And again, a cool checklist. Fiction, nonfiction, and then there's um, even more genres, drama, and poetry. I don't read much poetry at all. And then there's a whole nother section where you can just do favorite books, favorite authors, um, places I'd like to visit, books that changed my life, my childhood favorites, books I liked as a teenager, let's not go there, Books I liked in college. <laughs> this section is really funny. Books I was supposed to read and didn't, but I still might. I have a lot of those, a lot of those. So anyway, really cool book journal. I'll talk about books at the end unless I run long. Um, and then she got me this pattern, which I've been wanting. It's Threadworks Primitives, Primitive Crow. This is the companion to um, Primitive Needle Wicked. Ooh, I think I have that right here. Oh, I do, I have it right here because I still haven't finished it. Um, so it's the companion piece to this, which I absolutely love. Um, it's like half finished. What I wanna do is some cording like all the way around and then like a tassel right here and I just haven't gotten around to it but I will. Um, so this is the companion to that. And Amy knew I wanted it. So she saw it and she grabbed it. Okay. And then the last thing, um, first it came in this really cute bag, which looks 
handmade. Uh, but something tells me Amy didn't make this because I don't think Amy knows how to sew. <laughs> um, so she must have found it. I don't know. I don't know where she got it. I'll ask her. Um, but it's a really cute drawstring pouch with cute little wizard hats on it. And then this was the, the real present. <laughs> Amy stitched me. This is a primitive hair freebie sister stitcher, but she made some customizations. So she made this one redhead for me and this one is a brunette for her. And then she knows my favorite DMC color is 820. So she made the spools in my favorite color, that electric dark blue. And she tea and coffee and baked this fabric herself. I think she said it's a 28 count Carolina linen, I think she said. And then she tea, coffee, baked it. So I absolutely love this. And it will have a place of honor over here with all my stitchy stuff. So that's what Amy sent me. Um, and it was absolutely amazing and unexpected. I didn't know she was going to do all that. And now I have to stitch her something for her birthday in July. <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. That'll actually be really fun. I'll have to stop. Start plotting. Okay. So let's get to the stitching. I mean to more stitching. I've already showed you some. But let's get to some more. So after my last video. Um, I think in my last video I had just put a teensy tiny little start. Yeah, I had. I had, I showed you guys. It was just such a tiny little start. Um, I started Mill Hill Buttons and Beads Haunted Library. And um, I am doing, I'm copying Stephanie, Mrs. Oh So Crafty. Um, she took all the Mill Hill Christmas mansions, like Victorian mansions, which are absolutely beautiful. She took them all and she put them all on one um, piece of fabric and made like a village. So I'm going to do that with the Halloween ones. Um, and so I dyed my own fabric. It's 32 count. And I dyed it myself with Rit dye. People always ask me to do a tutorial. And I don't think I ever will. My process is not that interesting, I swear. Um, but what the the way I learned how to do this was by watching Farm Girl on Flosstube. If you go to Farm Girl's channel and scroll back to like some of her earlier videos, she has a very comprehensive video about how to how she dyes fabric with Rit dye. I watched that video and I basically do exactly what she does. So if you would like to try it yourself, I highly recommend her video. Um, so this was the fabric that I dyed for this Halloween village that I'm going to do. I'm super, super, super happy with how it turned out. Um, I absolutely love it. So after that video, I finished Haunted Library. And here it is. And I really love it. There are so many beads on this. It is heavy. I'll zoom in so you can see all the beads. Because, you know, they don't photograph very well. I will put a photo of this up on Instagram, but they just don't photograph well. They're subtly shimmery and sparkly. Um, beading this is actually pretty fun. It was just really intense because there's so many beads. <laughs> but... I just, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't put it down. I was just having way too much fun with it. So I basically worked on it until it was finished. So I'm going to do nine of these in total. I do have pretty narrow margins here. Um, because I didn't want to have to get more than a fat quarter. But they'll fit. So, yeah. That was an awesome finish. My back is a total disaster. I did post this on one of the Facebook groups, so I will show you guys as well. 
Yeah, that's bad. Um, my backs are not normally this terrible, I promise. Like, they're not the cleanest, most amazing backs. I'll show you a back of something else in a minute. Um, but this one was extra, extra, extra bad for me. So, I don't care because no one's ever going to see that except for right now. Um, what you're going to see is this, and this looks fine. So, I'm actually like kind of excited to move on and start another one, but I figure I should probably work on some whips first. Um, I, um, I don't even own like the next one. I have to buy it. I didn't think I would finish that one that fast. So that was actually my, um, January 13th start. No, February 13th. That was my, um, stitch, thir stitch Halloween 13 that I'm doing with Amy, um, uh, where the 13th of every month we start a new Halloween project because we both had so many like kitted up Halloween patterns. We wanted to kind of force ourselves to start them. So I have plenty of Halloween whips as well, but on the 13th, we're not working on whips. We're doing a new start. So I'm actually really proud that I did the new start and finished it. However, did I really finish it because I need to do eight more on that piece of fabric, but I still count that as like a finish, right? That's a finish, but it didn't lower my whip count because that is still on my whip list until all nine are done. So there you go. Um, so then it snowed. <laughs> so snow queen came back out and we are getting so, so close to being done with the stitching on snow queen. And then she has more beads than any mirabilia I've ever seen. So that will be fun. Um, but I do think once I get the stitching done and I start beading her, I think I will, I'll probably stick with that because I just want to see her done. And those beads are just going to make her look absolutely stunning. So although beads are a little bit of work, um, I think once I'm finally done with the stitching, I'm going to want to jump right into the beads and not like put it off because um, she's going to look so awesome when I get the beads on her. So this is Mirabilia Snow Queen and I work on her every time it snows. And we had a drought where we had no snow for about a month from, from Christmas until end of January. It did not snow, which is weird. But it's now started to snow a few times. So I've, I've been able to get some good work on her. And um, I've said before, in Colorado in March, that's our historic, like, snowy time. So um, we should get several snows in March. And um, a lot of times uh, we get a lot of snow. Like, we might get a foot um, in one storm. But um, I think that she can be finished if not in March, then in April. And by finished, I mean her stitching will be finished. I don't know if I can finish her beads by then, but I think I, I might be able to. I did look and I actually started her in April of 2017 or 18. I can't remember now exactly, but I started her in April. So I would love to finish her this April. That would be awesome. Um, but I've made really good progress. Um, she's on 32 count hand dyed by Stephanie fabric in Polywog Princess, which is just so beautiful. And this is in my last video, the lighting was not working with me. So um, hopefully now you'll get a really good look at her. She's so pretty. I did convert her hair. She is blonde in the pattern. And I made her a redhead, and I'm happy to share that with anyone who wants it. I About every video, I end up giving it out to somebody. Um, so, this is all done. And now we're just in this last section here. <clears throat> so, what's left? Her dress is really all that's left. Um, the dress is going to come down straight, pretty much straight down and meet up over here. So I've got all of that little bit there to do, right? 
all the, just this little strip here. It's mostly white. And then um, this is the bottom of her dress on the outline, by the way. And then her dress comes over, it kind of flares out. So we're going to get, it's going to kind of go like this. So I'm almost done with the whole outline and then it's just filling in. Um, and the fill in's actually going pretty fast because I can kind of just get to chunks of color. Like I'm just doing chunks of white, chunks of blue, chunks of whisper right there in that little bit of the dress. <laughs> I haven't done it yet, but that's coming up. Um, but yeah, the fill in's actually going faster then I like up here I was I got kind of slowed down by all the confetti and color changes but now we're kind of getting into like a couple of solid colors um it's going really quick so I'm super close to a finish on the dress and then I gotta do the beads so many beads but she's so close and I'm so excited <laughs> So it'll be a huge finish, huge finish. I can't wait to see what kind of stitch from stash credit I get on her. Lord knows I need it after my Nashville pre-order. So speaking of stitch from stash, um, I talked, I was talking with Amy and I was like, you know, cause I, I went to picture this plus I talked about it in my last video and I spent a lot of money on fabric but that was honestly like a once, not a once in a lifetime, but in a way like a one time experience. Like I might be able to get there again in the next few years, but it certainly was like a special opportunity. Um, if the Chiefs hadn't won the Super Bowl, I wouldn't have gone to Pictures Plus and I wouldn't have spent all that money. So I was asking Amy, I was like, do you think I should give myself a pass? Like this was a special like one time opportunity and it really shouldn't count for my monthly stitch from stash because my monthly stitch from stash budget is only $25. So like, I was like, you know, I really screwed that up and it's going to take me a heck of a lot of stitching to like climb out of that hole. And she was like, yes you should forgive yourself for your picture this plus haul. So I was like, okay, good, I'm going to. And then I made a market pre-order and spent almost as much money on that. So <laughs> um, I'm not forgiving myself for the market pre-order. So um, I, did, I did take out the picture this plus um, as like a special event, um, but the market pre-order that was all on me. So I need to dig myself out of that hole. Um, so I hope that Snow Queen is worth a lot of money when I get her done. I'm going to have to check with Stephanie and see what she says. Okay. So, um, my lunchtime project at work, I have been working on the witchy stitcher chopping mall stitch along. I'm way behind on the actual stitch along, but that's okay. It's really fun to stitch on. Here's what the frame looks like. And then she's been releasing the stores one by one. And I, and just yesterday she released, I think this one. So the top two thirds are done. And then we just have these left. Um, so I'm really behind, but that's okay. It is so fun to stitch. I hand dyed this fabric as well. This is 28 count Monaco. I love how this one turned out too. It's a blue gray. Um, so here's where I'm at. I'm almost done with store two. So I started with the border, did quite a bit of it, moved down to store one, moved back up and did more of the border, moved down to store two. So when I'm done with store two, more border, and then move over to store three. So I'm trying to do some border and then a store, some border, then a store. Um, so I'm almost done with store two. This pattern is, like I said, it's just a blast to stitch. It's really easy to read. 
she's using quite a lot of DMC A12, which does not photograph at all and doesn't always show up super great on video either. DMC A12 is a very subtle sparkle. It's never going to be like pow in your face. Um, so the pen, the black and orange pendants are in a 12, so you might see some sparkle there. Um, the blood is in a 12. There's some in the dress down here and in the sign. So very subtle, but really fun really fun but really really subtle i know aaron the blind stitcher my floss tube husband aaron i haven't gotten the ring yet um aaron was was commenting that he he can't see the sparkle at all now he's blind so you know i love you aaron um so you know it's obviously gonna be a little harder for him to make it out but it really is subtle it really is. So if you're also blind, it's probably not very easy to see that sparkle. It's definitely not like a crinic, like bling bling. I do love the effect of it. I really do. Um, I don't think I'm gonna, I, I've been using that as a lunchtime project just so I don't like totally give up on it, even though I'm so behind. Um, but I have different plans for March. So I will get to those after um, I finish with these whips, but I, I think I just am going to have to at some point like dedicate like a week of like evening stitching and just really try to like get some good progress on that. At, at lunch stitching is only 30 minutes and sometimes I'm actually like really disappointed like at how little. I'll stitch on that. When I get it out, I get all settled in and then 30 minutes is up. And I'm, I'm like, I got like one row of black done. Like, I feel like I didn't do anything. Okay, so then um, I felt like I needed a finish because I've been working on some whips and I've been making some really good progress, but I just felt like I needed a finish. So I went to my whip bin and I grabbed something that looked like it wouldn't take too much more work to finish. Um, and I got out Good Morning Maui from Etsy, and this is her Golden Girls pattern, and it's a really quite old whip for me. And when I pulled it out, I had B. Arthur done, and that was it. I didn't have anybody else done. I didn't have the words done. So I just had this one Golden Girl done. I finished it. This is on 14 count Ada that I hand dyed myself. This is, I think, the first time I ever tried dyeing fabric and I was very adventurous with my colors. <laughs> I actually love this fabric, um, but it's, it's pretty intense. So I had to find kind of the right pattern to put on there, but I finished it. Thank you for being a friend, it says. I'm going to finish this and I'm going to send it to a special friend. That person might right now be guessing that this is for them, but we'll see. It might still be a surprise. And then my last whip. I got out my Ingleside Imaginarium. Get ready for this tongue twister. I... I love Brittany. I love it. I love it. But it's the longest like stitch along name ever. Kaluna Brightburn's catalog for witches familiars. You can get that on her Etsy, Ingleside Imaginarium. Um, this is the border. And then every month this year, we'll fill in a familiar. A witch is familiar. Um, so I pulled, I had January done. I pulled this out and caught up February. And I'm really proud of myself because it's February 29th and I am caught up. And tomorrow the March block comes out. I'm doing this on 40 count fabric that Amy sent me. It's from, um, Vic, is it Victorian Motto that does the fabric of the month? I think it's Victorian Motto. 
And it doesn't have a name because she doesn't name her fabric of the month, but it's so awesome. It's such a good color. Um, I am, I started by, by stitching the very top of the border and then the rest of the border I'm going to do as I go. Um, it's really a pretty simple border. So I'm just, as I do each block, I'll fill in the border. And, um, so January's familiar was a cat, Felis. And then February's was a hair, Lepus. Um, I absolutely love this border. It's that Art Deco style. It's super cool. Um, and it's just looking great. It's looking so good. Brittany, you're doing such a good job. And I can't wait to see, like, what other animals we're going to get. Right? So, um, she did a sneak peek next month, of uh, this coming month, March. I think it's either a crow or a raven. I think. Um, I'm, I've been trying to think of, like, what, you know, what animals she could use as familiars. I'm thinking maybe a wolf or a dog, you know, a dog, a wolf, um, like a raven. Um, and then I'm kind of like, okay, what? I, oh, oh, I'm kind of stuck. So I don't know what the 12 are going to be. Like maybe a rat, probably a rat, right? Would that make sense? Yeah. Um, what other, we'll see. We'll see. I know, she, I know it's going to be brilliant. Um, but yeah, looking so good. Look at that cute little hair. And the hair went and like collected some like herbs and flowers for the witch for their potions. And I love it. It's looking so good. <laughs> it really like, I don't know. I'm sure it's looking really good on video too, but in person it looks so good. It looks so good. Okay, so those were all my whips. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about plans and then I'll talk about books. What's our time? Oh, we're doing so good on time. We're doing great. Okay, so plans. First of all, I am going to do my own form of March Madness. So my March Madness is going to be working on a different whip every day in March. So I will have worked on 31 whips because I am in the Facebook group, What Whip, which is a closed group um, run by Melanie Watkins, Soulful Stitcher. Hey, Melanie. I just watched your video this morning about your March Madness plans. Um, so anyway, the group is um, focused on getting our whips done. Um, a whip is WIP work in progress. So it's a cross stitch pattern that is not finished. So something that I am working on, but have not finished, right? So this will be a whip until the end of the year because I don't even have the rest of the pattern yet. <clears throat> but it can also be something where you do have the whole pattern, but you just haven't finished it. So the focus is to finish those whips. Um, so one of the goals of the group is that in 2020 you need to put at least 20 stitches in every single whip that you own. I have 92 whips and I want to get that number down. I also want to start all the things, but you know, what can you do? Um, I'm trying to not really go up on my whip number, even if I'm not making great progress at getting that number down. Um, sometimes like I might, if I have a new start, I'll do something small and try to actually finish it so that, um, it doesn't really inflate my whip number or I'll go and try to grab a small whip and finish it so that I can go down one number and then start something. So I kind of hover around 89, 90, 91, 92. I'm kind of always in that, in that number. But, um, so I have a lot of whips I need to, t to touch this year and it's really hard, um, to do that 
So I thought March Madness would be a good way to kind of force my hand. I'll get 31 knocked out really quick. Um, and then in May for Stitch Mania, I'm going to do the same thing. So a different whip every day for 31 more. I'll have touched 62 of my 90 something whips. And some of those I have already touched this year, like Snow Queen and Chopping Mall and which is familiar. So like of the 30 remaining, I might have 20 to 25 that I actually haven't worked on. So that'll give me like the rest of the year to get to those. So um, I do want some finishes as well, but at least this way I'll have worked on everything. Um, so those are my plans for March, different whip every day. And I was kind of like, oh man, this is going to be hard because I was thinking, you know, every evening when I sit down to stitch, I'll be pulling out a different whip. And then I thought, okay, how am I going to keep up with my stitch alongs, like my witches familiar and my linen and threads and my chopping mall. And, um, you know, how am I going to do that? And then I'm like, oh my God. And then if it snows, I need to work on snow queen. How am I going to do that? Because it's going to snow a ton in March and I'm trying to work on all these different whips and it's going to be such a mess. And then Amy, my friend Amy Gable Stitcher, who I mentioned five times every video, was like, why don't you make your lunch project your whip, your different whip every day? She's like, so then, you know, five days of the week you're, you're taken care of. And then on the weekends, like you can figure it out. And I was like, oh, well, that's brilliant. That makes a lot of sense because all I have to do is put like 20 stitches in these. I mean, I'd like to do more than that, but that's the minimum. So half an hour of stitching at lunch, I should be able to do that. So that was such a weight off my shoulders because then that leaves my evenings totally free. I can continue to work on the whip if I feel like it. I can work on Snow Queen if it snows. I can work on my stitch alongs to stay caught up. I can um, pull something out that's close to a finish and go for a finish. I can do a new start. I can do whatever. So those are, that was a brilliant idea. Seems so obvious once you hear it, but it wasn't occurring to me at the time. So that's my plan for March. One other craft stitchy thing to talk about, and then I'll talk about books real quick and we'll get out of here. Um, so I was contacted by Fat Quarter Shop and they asked me if, um, they could send me, um, some free stuff and they were like, if you want to use it yourself, great. And if you don't, um, do a giveaway. Now I haven't gotten it yet, but it, it's on the way. Um, but they were like, you know, we're about to start a new stitch along um, in March. Would you be interested? And I was like, maybe. Like, I love a stitch along. But I'm like, I probably would need to see what it looks like. And um, they were like, oh, well, here's what it looks like. And I was like, um, I love that. Yes. I would definitely be interested in stitching that. So. This is what the pattern, I pulled it up on their website. Um, it's by Lori Holt, Be In My Bonnet, and it's called Prim Village. And it's these rainbow like salt box houses. I do apologize. I see that there's a glare. I'm sorry. Maybe that's better. So it's a 15 week stitch along. There's 12 houses, so 12 of the weeks will be that you're stitching the house, um, one house, and then the other weeks are going to be the border, and then if you look in between the houses, there are churn dash quilt blocks. I think those are churn dash. Oh, there's some other ones too. I don't, I don't know. No. I think they're all the same. Anyway, um... So one week we'll be doing those, and then one week we'll be doing the overall border. I feel like that's like a generous time um, for this. So that's why I was willing to commit. The houses, I kind of like zoomed in, and the houses are about like 30 
stitches wide by like 60 tall ish so they're not terribly big I was like I could do one of those a week so if you want to join in this stitch along or if you just want the pattern go to fat quarter shop and you can get it there and it's just it's so cute um, they're gonna send me the pattern and the fabric and the floss I'm super super excited um, oh, the other thing that is the pattern comes with this cute little enamel charm. It's really cute. Oh, it's right here. It's like my favorite color, that minty aqua. So, um, I think this should be coming in the mail any day. I hope so because... Um, for Wednesday, March 4th next week, you're supposed to have this little dash outline done around the border. So I might be like playing a little catch up. Um, and then after that, it's just one house a week. So I will be participating in this stitch along and I'm really, really excited that they reached out and asked me to do so. And if anybody loves that pattern as much as I do, you can go to their website and get it. Um, or depending on what ends up coming in the box that I get or package I get, I don't know that it's a box. Um, I might be giving one away because I can't remember if they said they're going to send me an extra one so I can give it away. So stay tuned. Next video. Okay. That is all the stitching stuff. If that's all you came here for, thank you so much. You can leave now, but I am going to talk about books. If you're interested in hearing more about the books I've been reading, stay and listen. Let me just do a quick time check. Okay, we're good. We're good. I'm going to make this kind of brief. I don't think, um, because I need to eat lunch and then go to my class and I don't want to be rushed for time. Um, I have four books to talk about, but I'll try to, you know, kind of be brief. So, um, the first book I read was uh, called The Night Country by Melissa Albert. It is um, a young adult fantasy. And this is a sequel. Um, the first book is called The Hazelwood. And this is the sequel, The Night Country. I really, really liked both books. I loved The Hazelwood and I liked The Night Country just as much. I think I gave them both five stars. Um, the Hazelwood was a little bit controversial. It was definitely one of those books where it was either love or hate. I was really surprised how polarizing it was. Um, it's it's a re it's a fairy tale. It's not quite a retelling, but it's definitely Alice in Wonderland inspired. Um, it features a main character named Alice who finds herself in this um, fairy tale world. Um, that ends up being real. So like there's been a, a book um, based on this world, um, like a popular children's story. Um, and it turns out that it's actually a real place. Her grandmother was the author of the book and um, it really exists. So it's called The Hinterland. So book one is about her discovering that the Hinterland is a real place and going there and what happens from there. Um, like I said, it's Alice in Wonderland inspired, but it's definitely not just like a retelling. Um, what was really fascinating about the book is that it is, it is dark and twisted. It's brutal. It's not a happy fairy tale. It's a creepy, dark fairy tale. And I wonder if that's why people don't like that book. Maybe they were expecting something a little more light and happy. Um, the other thing about the book is that the love story in the first one does not play out in any kind of typical fashion. And I think that's another reason people do not like that book. I have found in my experience with, um, the online community talking about books is that a lot of people, if they don't love the main character or if the main character does, doesn't end up with the love interest that they wanted, or if the book doesn't kind of go exactly how they wanted, then they hate the book. 
Um, I think some people have a really hard time just recognizing a really well-written story, a well-plotted story. If it doesn't go just the way they want, they didn't like it. And that's fair. I, I get a little salty about it, but it's absolutely fair. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Um, but what I found is that sometimes with reviews, you really have to take them with that grain of salt. If you are a person who can just enjoy a book for what it is, and it doesn't have to be like she ends up with the dude, then um, you might see that review, that really bad review and be like, you know what, I'm going to still give it a try because I think, you know, I can get past that. Whereas, you know, someone else might be like, well, I'm not reading it then. And that's fine. But just, I think it's interesting because sometimes I think like ratings get really skewed because of that. I will say you can't trust ratings on Goodreads anyway. Just don't. Okay. Because, um, I don't even, I, I don't want to get into it, but Goodreads ratings are notoriously very odd. I think it's the kind of people that are doing ratings and their interests and some books are really, really falsely elevated, really good ratings and some are not and whatever. So um, anyway, where am I going with this? The point is that a lot of people didn't like the Hazelwood, <laughs> but I really liked it. Like I said, dark and twisted. The author's writing style was very, very gripping to me. It was very in, in, interesting. Um, sarcastic and dark, a little goth. And um, I loved the main character who was also like a dark, creepy little goth girl. And um, I thought it was great. It was really messed up. It was really messed up, but I loved it. I love that it wasn't what I expected. I love that it took like those fairy tale tropes and just like demolished them. Um, so the sequel, The Night Country, I also loved. So The Night Country is about, um, the hinterland has been, um, like most of the, the characters in the hinterland have been kicked out into the real world. And the hinterland has been closed off to them, so they can't get back. Um, and so book two is about them adjusting to life among us mere humans. Um, and then in the middle of all that, like some serial killer starts killing off characters from the hinterland. And Alice, the main character, is trying to solve this murder mystery. So um, I can't really say much more than that without like totally spoiling it for people. But if you liked The Hazelwood, I think you will like The Night Country. If you um, are interested in a dark, twisted, creepy, but still funny, sarcastic, and um, engaging read, then check out, check out The Hazelwood. It's really good. Like I said, five stars, quite enjoyed. So then I went, I was like, what do I want to read next? I don't know. Um, I started looking through my Kindle and I literally was like, I have some books that I've had sitting on it for years. I haven't had my Kindle for that long, but like I had moved it from like my nook, you know, to my Kindle at some, some point, just eBooks I've had forever. And I was like, you know what? I just need to pick one of these and read it. Um, I went all the way to the end of my Kindle library and picked the last book. And that was Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters. And I loved this book. I didn't know what the heck this book was, honestly. Like, I knew nothing about it. I didn't go read, like, a blurb or anything. I mean, I think when I downloaded the book 10 years ago, I might have known something about it then, but I had forgotten it since then. Um, so I, I literally went in blind. 
This book is about Victorian London lesbians. The actual cover is much more risque than this. This is like the PG cover for us Americans. <laughs> it's got a more salacious cover, um, but I didn't want to, you know, offend anybody's sensibilities. Um, but this book was so good. So first of all, it's that historical fiction element that I love. I love like hearing about 18th century or 19th century London or France or anything like that kind of historical stuff. I'm, I'm into it. Um, her depictions of this time period to me seemed legitimate. Where, where she took artistic le liberties was with the lesbian aspect because I'm guessing it was really, really, really hard to be a lesbian in Victorian London <laughs> and to even like have a lover, um, to find someone who felt the same, um, when you couldn't be open about that. So where she took some liberties is like, um, there are like groups of lesbians that, you know, they meet here or at this club or they meet at this bar and, um, the lesbians find each other a little too easily in, in the book is, is what I'm getting at. So I think she took that, that liberty, but otherwise I felt like what she was saying about Victorian London was spot on and was accurate. And, um, so yeah, the book is, um, about a, a young woman basically realizing she's a lesbian and then um, some love affairs of sorts um, that happen after that. And um, it was just really good. It was written really beautifully, really beautifully, really compelling characters, um, like characters who felt like real people that were more than one dimensional. Um, there was some political stuff like thrown in, which was not expected, but really cool. Um, one of the, the characters who ends up in the story um, is involved in the socialist movement of the time. Basically, at what, what that meant at that point was like trying to get fair wages and union rights, essentially, for, for workers, for working class and for the poor. Um, so there's like some political rallies and stuff like that, which was, again, fascinating to read about what that might have been like at the time. Um, and um, just like the the main character kind of finding herself and discovering herself. She does some pretty terrible things after really terrible things are done to her. Um you know, she's not necessarily the most redeemable person. She she makes some really bad choices and does some pretty bad things. Um, but she does find redemption and she does find love at the end. And um, it was just really good, really dimensional, complicated. Um, and it really kept me entertained. And, what, you know, it kept me, it kept me reading. I was never like, oh, book over. And it's quite a long book, but it was really good. And um, if you want to know what tipping the velvet means, you're going to find that out about 80% through the book. Or Google it. Okay. Two more books and then we're out of here. Um, so the next book I read was, I don't um, have it here with me. It was a library book, but I do intend to buy it at some point. Um, it's V.E. Schwab's second book in her Darker Shade of Magic trilogy. This is the third book. Um, the third book is called A, A Conjuring of Light. The second book was called A Gathering of Shadows. So I read this second book, A Gathering of Shadows. Um, it was excellent. I loved the first book, A Darker Shade of Magic, and I loved, loved, loved the second book, A Gathering of Shadows. Cannot, cannot recommend enough, highly enough. Um, 
I have given a thorough review of A Darker Shade of Magic in a previous video. Um, it's always hard to talk about sequels because it's like I feel like I'm just repeating like that first book and then I, the sequel, talking about the sequel, it's going to have spoilers. So it's like I don't really know what to say um, that wouldn't, you know, be spoilery. But um, this series is excellent. It has raves online um the the premise essentially is that there are these parallel worlds that kind of like are lay on top of each other and there are some magician type people some magical people that can pass between the worlds um so all of these worlds have a a city called London. Um they all like somehow have, you know, the city has sprung up and it's called London in all of the worlds even though the rest of the world is totally different from like what we would expect from our world. Um so gray London is our world essentially, but like in the 1800s. Um Red London is the main character, Kel. That's his world. And then there's White London, which is this horrible, brutal place of cutthroat, like, criminals. And it's, it's, a, it's bad. It's a bad place. And then Black London is the worst place. And it's um, a place where magic got corrupted and basically ate and destroyed everything in the world and they had to close off Black London so that that corruption wouldn't spill over into the other worlds. So Black London is this like black hole. No one has gone to Black London in like hundreds of years. It's been closed off. It's an unknown. Um, so Kel, the main character, can travel between the worlds. Um, only a very, very few um, people can do that. Um, nobody else in the worlds are are allowed to travel if even if they could figure out how. Um, it's like expressly forbidden because they don't want corruption and um, like things bleeding into the worlds. like they want them separate. Um, but Kel is like a messenger that can go between worlds to pass messages and updates among the leaders and um I can't I can't really tell you what else is gonna happen without spoiling it but um it's really really good um Kel finds himself into in some trouble and um has to basically save the worlds um and he I don't want to spoil it. Um, so book two is a continuation. Um, at the end of book one, he thought he had accomplished his task, but he had not. So book two is um, some repercussions and fallout. And um, book two features a magical tournament. It's like the Triwizard Cup in Harry Potter. So um, um, in Red London, um, some of the outer territories, like they, everybody converges on Red London for this like magic tournament, um, where the magicians fight each other with magical elements. There's, you know, a lot of intrigue, political intrigue and crazy things that happen in the tournament. Um, people who are participating in the tournament on incognito in disguise and um it's it's very good it's very good there are some new characters in this book um and some old favorites from book one and it was excellent and that's i feel like i did a really poor job of talking about that book but i do encourage you to check it out if that sounds at all interesting to you i do want to um quantify that this is not a young adult series um, this author, V.E. Schwab, writes children's books, young adult, and adult. Um, so her books sometimes do get, like, filed as young adult. Um, this is an adult series. Keep that in mind. Tipping the Velvet is 
definitely an adult book. All right, and then I just finished last night. This is my last book to talk about, and then we're done. I just finished um, J. Kristoff's God's Grave. This is book two in the Nevernight Chronicles. Book one is called Nevernight, and this is book two. Um, so Nevernight is about an assassin, or uh, well, it's about a girl who trains to be an assassin. Her name is Mia. She has um, a blood debt, basically. She is out for revenge. When she was a child, her family was slaughtered. Um, her father was high in like the political world and he was planning a rebellion um, to put a new king on the throne. He was called the Kingmaker um, because he was trying to make a new king and he his rebellion was thwarted and he was murdered um, in front of Mia and um, she lost her whole family and she fell in with an assassin who started to train her and um, book one is about her going to basically Assassin Academy <laughs> to learn how to be a better assassin so that she can go get revenge on the people who murdered her family. So um, book one was so, so good. Um, this is also adult, by the way, not young adult. Although Mia is 16 in book one, um, it is an adult book. Um, so she goes and learns how to be basically a badass assassin. And then um, book two is her finally getting to, like she's completed her training. She's a full-fledged assassin now and she wants to go get her revenge. So book two is about, wow, wow, <laughs> book two. Um, Part of her plot to get her revenge involves her basically becoming a gladiator, like literally like the movie Gladiator, like she kind of does that. Like she poses um, as a slave and gets bought into this gladiator house and um, is trying to work her way up to like the ultimate gladiator event. Um, so that she can exact her revenge um, on the people who murdered her family. It makes sense in the book. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but basically to get close to the people responsible, she needs to do this whole ruse. So um, book two is so cool because like it's, it's like this whole different setting um, you're expecting her to like go do her like cloak and dagger assassin stuff and instead this book is all about gladiators and like trial combat to the death. Was not expecting that but really good. Um, it was really good and then at the um, at the end, um, some crazy twists happen. Like literally the last like 10 pages is like bombshell, bombshell, bombshell. So you're like, what? Um, luckily I have book three, so I don't have to sit and wait for a year for a conclusion to this story. I own book three. I'm not going to read it right away, but I will probably read it soon. Um, but yeah, this series is excellent. I highly recommend. Check out Nevernight check out God's Grave, and then check out Dark Dawn. That's what I'm doing. Um, I have uh, a, a type of book I enjoy, if you can't tell. Um, young adult to adult dark fantasy, kind of like my wheelhouse. <laughs> so, all right. So that's all my book talk. Um, if you have any thoughts about any of those books or want to chat more about books, like I'm always happy to do so. I gotta go. Um, thanks for watching. I will see you guys next time. Bye.